Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, let your breath breathe on us, anoint us, inspire us, tune our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to your presence among us. Alert us to your call. Guide us that we might pay attention to you and your work in the world. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from the third chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 13. Listen to God's word. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. Moses looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why this bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt? But Moses, and he said, so God said, I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said again to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is God's name? What should I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. God said further, Thus, you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my title for all generations. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. What is it that gets your attention? Is it the sound of a car alarm going off outside with a horn just like your own? Is it the coronavirus graphic flashing on screen during a newscast? Is it a particular ringtone, a loved one's voice, a baby bunny hopping in your backyard, a TikTok video, a silly meme? Is it a t-shirt that says 2020, one star, I wouldn't recommend it. See, there is so much that vies for our attention each day. Social media news feeds and hungry kids, the thunder of the recent thunderstorms, of the recent rainstorms, or our own sense of worry. Life as it is, it plays out, throwing marketing pitches to us all day long, trying to command our attention and consequently our energy, calling us into action. 
In the familiar story that we heard this morning, God gets Moses' attention through the burning bush in the wilderness. This brush fire is odd, we are told, as the fire burns but does not consume the bush. Curious Moses steps away from the flock of his father-in-law's sheep that he's herded to this far side of the mountain to learn more and see what's going on. Before he knows it, he has drawn near to the presence of God. God tells Moses that the mistreatment of the Israelite people has gotten God's attention. God has seen the suffering of God's people at the hand of the Egyptians. God has heard their cries. But even for God, simply noticing the injustices experienced by the oppressed is unacceptable. Action is necessary. Wrongs must be righted, the oppressed must be set free, and God needs Moses' help. So God gets Moses' attention, appealing to him in this conversation. See, God needs a shepherd who can lead people through rough terrain in the wilderness. God needs someone who knows Pharaoh and the Egyptian people, but who identifies with and has a heart for the Hebrew people. God needs someone who themselves has been saved, who knows what deliverance feels like in their bones, and who knows also how complicated it can be. God needs someone who understands the tensions in the world, who has gotten caught up in the conflict of the culture around them, even when that engagement has been fraught with Moses' own sin and imperfection. God needs Moses to show up, to step up, to set God's people free. Now Moses raises questions and even objections in the three chapters that follow these verses, and rightly so. God is asking Moses to do the impossible. God's calling Moses to face an oppressive sovereign and single-handedly liberate an entire enslaved people. But God assures Moses that God will go with him, equip him, enable him to get Pharaoh's attention and the attention of the Israelite people. God will be at work with and through Moses to bring about the justice that is needed. See, the story is not just about a call. It is a story that reflects God's priorities. See, God sees Moses just as God sees those who are enslaved, and God invites Moses to shift his vantage point to, and his social location to identify not with the Pharaoh in whose house he was reared, but with the slave woman who gave him birth. God sees Moses and claims his complicated self as God's own. And God reminds Moses that God's own includes those who are being mistreated and maligned, and the faithful response is action. Now, I like to identify with a story because I like to think that God can work, the God, that the God who can work through a murderer and a stutterer with a fractured past is someone who can work through me too, with all of my limitations and fears and imperfections. See, that God must be able to work through each one of us. I like to think that the God who equipped Moses to do the impossible in all of his limitations can fill the gap for us too can equip us and stand by us. Now, I do believe that this is true, and I have preached it before. But another look at this text also shows the nature of God's call. See, God calls those in a position of privilege to pay attention to the broken systems of the world. God calls attention to the needs of those on the margins and calls all who are within earshot to be instruments of liberation. So see, siblings, if we want to identify with Moses and our ability to be called by God, we also need to identify with the substance of Moses' call as our own. Candidly, it is a call that is painted all throughout the texts of the entirety of Scripture. 
God continually disrupts the power structures of society to lift up those whom society has a, to, to whom a society has attributed no worth. The younger sibling with no authority, the woman with no voice, the nation with no power, the carpenter messiah with no throne. God calls over and over again, inviting the world to reevaluate the things of this world to which we have grown accustomed and redirect energy away from the status quo. God calls us to spend our time administering grace, working for justice, especially on behalf of those made most vulnerable by the powers that be. Howard Thurman reminds us of this in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, when he says, the basic fact is that Christianity, as it was born in the mind of this Jewish teacher and thinker, appears as a technique of survival for the oppressed. That it became through the intervening years a religion of the powerful and the dominant, used sometimes as an instrument of oppression, must not tempt us into believing that it was thus in the mind and life of Jesus. For in Jesus was life, and the light, the life was the light of all. Wherever Christ's spirit appears, the oppressed gather fresh courage. For Jesus announced the good news that fear, hypocrisy, hatred, and the three hounds of hell that trail, that the trail of the disinherited need have no dominion over them. We must confess that for centuries, millennia, Christians have proclaimed a God made in our own image. We have confused Christianity and nationalism over again. We have used the rhetoric of faith to harm others with quote-unquote divine backing. We have used individual lines of scriptures to support the rhetoric of hate from the indoctrination of slavery to the, to the subordination of women to the exclusion of LGBTQ plus persons. Susan B. Anthony is quoted to have said, I distrust those people who know so well what God wants them to do because I notice it always coincides with their own desires. However, the whole of scripture does not suggest that our sacred text can be treated as a mad lib in which humankind can freely substitute nouns of our own choosing to replace the name of Christ, the true author and perfecter of our faith. Rather, the God of scripture calls us over and over again throughout those same millennia to use our gifts, however imperfect and fragile and limited and as exhaustive as they may be, to partner with God in the act of gracious liberation. Candidly, we too are called to help God free the oppressed. We are called to look with divine eyes and listen with divine ears to hear the cries, not of our own interests, but those in need. We are called out of our comfort zones, invited to step up and do something, not to advance our own brand or agenda, but rather to advance the needs of others, those on the margins most especially, with God's help. See, we are called to shift our gaze, to take a hard look at ourselves and at the world around us. And see, as we acknowledge the intersections of this present day and history, we see that in spite of the centennial anniversary of the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote in the United States, voter suppression still remains a thing especially for people of color. And we are reminded once more that women of all colors, creeds, identities, and orientations are still not granted equal ground of their male counterparts, of our male counterparts. Just a few days ago, we marked the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington. And once more, we are invited to open our eyes and see that all lives simply can't matter until black lives matter. The deep racial divide that remains in our nation is laid out before us. Even as Pastor Randy named early in our service, 
when he noted the differences in response of the Kenosha Police Department this past week, who within days shot a black man seven times in the back, while a white teen carrying a semi-automatic rifle past police cars walked free even as witnesses cried out to police that this young man had just shot people. Yes, it's complicated, and both accounts are still under investigation, but the differences are striking. See, we are called as a people of faith to live our faith by living lives of action, to engage in our society and with our neighbor, with our political system, with our finances, and even as the Apostle Paul calls us, engaging our enemy with our eyes and hearts fixed on the needs of all God's people, especially the most vulnerable. As God's encounter with Moses reminds us, God is, in fact, the initiator of this action. God is the power who disrupts the powers that be in the world over and over again. All throughout scripture, God issues calls and commands that shake the foundations of the governments of our world and redirect power and agency toward the marginalized. God sets the captive free. God welcomes the outcast. God forgives the sinner. God elevates the lowly. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King reminds us, one of the great problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites, polar opposites, so that love is identified with the resignation of power and power with the denial of love. But power properly understood is nothing but the ability to achieve purpose. It is the strength required to bring about social, political, and economic change. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. As a people of faith, our challenge and our call is to pay attention to the ringing bell above us that gets our attention, but also to the voice of God in our midst, calling us to notice those who are on the margins, those who are being mistreated, those who are being told that they don't matter because they are different, to laws and practices that create artificial hierarchies that disenfranchise or harm. And then we need to step into humble service with a willingness to answer God's call to love, to love as the Apostle Paul reminds us, to love in ways that are humble and compassionate, to love in ways that are countercultural, to love in ways that even dismantle enmity, to love in ways that are gracious, even as they are uncomfortable, to love those who are not like us, to love when it means surrendering worldly power, to love when it is uncomfortable or hard work, to love knowing that we are strengthened for this call by a God who first loved us. Friends, with that thanksgiving and with hope, may we step into this world as instruments of liberation, as instruments of love. May it be so. Amen.